The bottom line is that when we help young children become emotionally literate, they'll be more successful in school and life. One of the things I learned over my many years in the classroom was before you teach anything to a young child, you first have to identify the precursors. And that means what comes first before the actual skill you're trying to teach. And in this case, when it came to social skills, the skill that's a precursor was teaching children how to identify and name their own feelings and emotions. And there are many different ways to do this, but one of my favorite ways is by using a bingo game. I love to introduce my students to bingo games very early in the school year, very simple bingo games, not complicated ones. And then I just change up the bingo games that we use all year long. Once they've learned how to play the game, then I can just switch it up. And this right here I have for my viewers on the screen is a picture of my emotions bingo game. And for our listeners, you can find these on pre-K pages. So one of the things I did was I made sure to use pictures, photographs, I should say, of real children displaying different emotions. Because what we know about young children is they're very, very concrete, right? They learn from the real, the concrete, to the abstract, the not real. So if we're going to teach them to identify feelings and emotions, we want to use actual photographs. Once they understand the feeling and emotion, then we can move on to more abstract types of identification like emojis and so forth. And one of the things that I want to say about using children's photographs is that we know that in today's day and age, our youngest children are spending even more time on screens than ever before. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. There's arguments for both. But what I can say is that we learn how to identify feelings and emotions of others by looking at the faces of others and seeing their reaction. But if indeed we're staring at a screen more often than ever before, and we're looking less at actual faces, then it begs the question, are we learning how to identify feelings and emotions adequately in today's day and age? And that's what I've noticed and many, many other teachers around the world have noticed in recent years since the invention of the tablet and the smartphone is that children seem to have more trouble with this skill than ever before. And this is just one of the many reasons that go into it. So when it comes to teaching feelings and emotions, I really like to use real photographs first and then once they learn how to identify feelings and emotions in people, then we can move on to other things like emojis. And one more thing about bingo games. I get lots of questions about bingo games, like how do you play it with the whole class? Four-year-olds are too little. And the answer to that is I only play it in small groups. Doing anything with a whole class of four-year-olds, assuming that your class has more than 12 kids in it, is going to be a struggle. And I don't like to struggle as a teacher. I like to, to work smarter and not harder. And so when I do bingo games, I do them in a small group. And when I do it with just a small group of students, I'm talking like four to six maximum, it's so much easier. They're more successful. I feel less frustrated. <laughs> it's a win-win for everybody. So if you've ever done bingo with young kids and not been successful, I want you to try it in small groups. That way you can also scaffold for support if they need extra help learning how to identify a name, those super important feelings and emotions. All right, so next up is a memory matching game. So for our listeners, I have a stack of cards in my hand and each card has a picture of a child displaying a different feeling or emotion. Emotions like scared, happy, uh, sad, angry, things like that. And I've printed these out. You can find these at pre-K pages and I've turned them into a memory game. Have you ever played that with your kids before? So you take each card and you put it face down on a flat surface like the table or a floor. And then you gather your group around. I like to do this in small groups because remember, less frustration. And then the kids take turns flipping over the cards and they try to find a match. And so for our listeners, I am turning over the cards here 
on the screen. And so, oh, I got happy and surprised. Do those match? Let's look. You could have everyone in your group try to uh, replicate the faces. Let's show our, each other happy. Now let's show each other surprised. Kids love to mimic the emotions on these cards. And oh, they don't match, do they? Let's turn them over. And now let's try two more. I know this one was happy, so I'm gonna turn it back over. I'm pretending I'm a child here. And, <gasps> well, you look at that. Listener, I just found a match. I found two happies and guess what? I get to take those two and I get to keep them. And then we keep playing until all the matches have been found. I just have a small sample here on the screen for our viewers, but there are a lot more cards in this deck and you can find that at prekpages.com. Okay, so next up is my feelings and emotions check-in chart. So you may be familiar with check-in, right? It's a way for young children when they first enter the classroom at the beginning of each day to let you know they're there, to formally check in, if you will. I've done this many different ways over the years. One of my favorite ways is to put children's name cards out on the table and as they enter the classroom, they search for their name card and then they put it into a chart to indicate that they're there. I've done it um, where the chart says school or home and then I designate one helper to put the absent children's name cards on the home side of the chart. I've done it where they have a little pocket with their name on it on a chart and they put their name card in there. And that has worked really well for me over the years. And then of course, some of you may be familiar with question of the day, which we also have at pre-K pages. But question of the day is another type of quote unquote check-in, if you will. Um, I've always done it during math time. And it's a question like, you know, do you prefer pizza or hot dogs type of a thing? And then they put their name card on a different side of the T-chart. And then you can use that to analyze the data that you've collected, compare and so forth. It's more for graphing. So I like to use a check-in when they come in, but many teachers have told me that this feelings check-in is a real game changer because you get all the benefits of a morning check-in and the social emotional learning too. So the way this works, and you can find this at pre-K pages as well, just type in feelings check-in into the search box. Um, and for our viewers, it's on the screen here. You can take these pictures and now I have the real photographs in this as well. And I take those photographs and I glue them to a library pocket. Yes, they do still exist. You can find them on Amazon. <laughs> and then I glue them to a chart. And now the children are still locating their name when they come into the classroom each morning. But then they put it in the pocket with the emotion that they're feeling that day. And so on the screen, if you're watching, if you're a viewer, you can see there's excited, scared, happy, angry, and so forth. And you can choose the pictures that you wanna use, but they check in. And then when you have your morning meeting, you can actually use the chart to talk about feelings and emotions with your students. So this has been a real game changer for many teachers. So now you're starting your day with a check-in, which is great. It's a literacy activity, right? Because they're looking for their name. And you're also getting kind of checking in on the pulse of how they're feeling. You're acknowledging that feeling. And then you're also able to reinforce and maybe give prompts like, oh my goodness, I see that. Emily is feeling so excited today. Um, Emily, why are you so excited? Oh, oh, you got a new puppy last night? Wow, that's, that is exciting. Wouldn't that be a great topic for you to write about today during writing time? Because I'm sneaky like that. I like, I like to give those little prompts too. And oh my goodness, I see David and he is feeling so angry, David. What is it that we can do to help you? Why are you feeling so angry? Now you don't have to do it for every single kid because if you have a normal size class, which is usually more than 10 or 12, then you won't have time to do all of that. And that's totally fine too. But I would pick and choose some different pockets to talk about each day. And then you could offer some solutions. Oh, you know what, David? I had a fight with my brother once too. You know what helped me? 
And then I might launch into a little personal story, maybe give him some tips on uh, tools he can use. You know what else we have in our calm down corner or cozy corner or Zen zone, whatever you call it. That's last week's episode. Um, you can give him some ideas for tools or strategies he could use, right? And we're not talking a full-blown soliloquy here. We're just talking about a few quick tips and tricks, but checking in with the children to see how they're feeling really goes a long way, especially when you're starting out your day together. So next up, we have Play-Doh mats. So we already talked about how we want to start identifying feelings and emotions with real photographs. But once your children move beyond that stage and they can start identifying those feelings and emotions in other things and other ways, then you might wanna use these Play-Doh mats. Now these Play-Doh mats are literacy rich in addition to making the faces with Play-Doh. They offer many other opportunities, but this is a great way for your kids to get hands-on practice with feelings and emotions. Once they've already established that they have a solid understanding of feelings and emotions with real people, right? And with these Play-Doh mats, you can also ask them, can you show me that emotion with your face as well? So they're seeing it. They're seeing the emotion displayed on the mat. They're saying it. I feel happy. I feel this. I feel that. Whatever the emotion on the mat is. And then there's a blank face there. And then they can make that matching emotion with Play-Doh. And so we know that anytime we add Play-Doh in early childhood, it's kind of like magic because children are drawn to Play-Doh like moths to flame. So it's a great engaging activity that you can do to kind of extend the learning after you've already established that, right? In addition to all that, we also have our Feelings and Emotions Kit, which has booklets, cards, and posters that you can use to teach children about feelings and emotions. And next up is bingo. Now, there are many educational benefits of bingo. I know, you're shocked, right? I was too at first until I really thought about it. And I have a blog post out there in the blogosphere all about the educational benefits of bingo. But let me just say that bingo teaches self-regulation skills, right? Because your students, they sit around and they each have a bingo card and they have to listen. That's a skill. Listening is a skill, right? Would you like your kids to listen more? Mm -hmm. Play more bingo. So they have to listen, right? And they have to wait for you to say the word. So let's say we're playing emotions bingo and I say happy, okay? So they're listening, they're waiting for you to say the word, and now they're going to find that picture on their mat. That is visual discrimination. It's also auditory processing, right? So many, many skills with that. Then we also have Play-Doh. Now we all know, I'm preaching to the choir here, right? That Play-Doh is perfect for fine motor skills. So when they're rolling and uh, flattening out things and manipulating Play-Doh with their fingers, we know that these are super important fine motor skills that our students are going to need in order to be able to eventually hold a writing tool and write letters, words, numbers, etc. So the more they touch, feel, and manipulate things, especially Play-Doh, the more they exercise those small muscles in their fingers, hands, wrists, and arms that they will need to eventually write. So Play-Doh, fine motor. Of course, the Play-Doh mats that we have, the Play-Doh feelings mats, are rich with literacy because um, there's a dot under each of the words in the sentence, I feel happy. And they have to, this concept's a print, right? They're learning one-to-one -one correspondence in print, right? So there's lots of that left to right directionality. Um, all of that good stuff is in there as well. Memory, the matching memory game, right? Memory games are fantastic for young children. In fact, I think that children today don't get enough playing of memory games. So that's going to help them with recall, working memory, all of those really super important skills that our young children need to have. They also, when they're playing these types of games where they have to take a turn, right? It's not my turn. It's someone else's turn. It's turn-taking, right? That's a very difficult skill to teach young children. Could your children use a little more practice with turn-taking? Well, 
play memory or play any type of a game where they have to wait for a turn and you've got the golden opportunity to do it right there. So there are plenty of things being taught in all of these um, emotions and feelings, activities and games that I shared with you today um, to help your children be successful, not just in school, but in life, right? Because we're teaching children so that they can be successful in school, yes, but ultimately in life. Because these skills that we're teaching them have to transfer over into their real world lives. And if you're wondering why in the world are we even teaching these things in school, let me just say that emotional literacy is a thing, right? We know that children who can identify and name their own feelings and emotions and then can do the same in other people, they have what we call emotional literacy. They're emotionally literate. These skills are skills they're going to use every single year of their school career and in life. Because think about it. If you're in the workplace, let's say, you know, your kids 25 years from now or whatever it is, have a job and they're in an office situation and they have a coworker that they have a conflict with, but yet they aren't emotionally literate. How will they be able to tell how that coworker is feeling. Maybe they won't understand the coworker is angry with them. Maybe they won't get the subtle nuances or references. Maybe they will say all the wrong things that make this coworker angry. If they're emotionally literate, then they know how to respond to the other person's feelings and emotions that they're noticing. It's a win-win for everybody. So the bottom line is that when we help young children become emotionally literate, they'll be more successful in school and life. Speaking of feelings and emotions, did you know that the Sort of Success Summit topic this year was all about social emotional learning? Yep, that's right. 19 speakers over five days addressing nothing but the importance of social emotional learning and practical strategies that you can take back and use in your classroom right away. And the good news is that it's not too late to buy a ticket if you miss the live event. So you can go ahead and do that at SortaSuccessSummit.com. And yes, there are certificates of attendance for 19 hours. There you can also pick up all the extras like video replay, audio replay, expanded reflection guides, and more. We like to call this PD in your PJs. Until next time, I'm Vanessa Levin, onward and upward. 